Today, we're gonna be talking primarily about our work uh, on uh, uh, soft to define underwater networking systems. And uh, uh, this is uh, work with a number of uh, um, members of uh, our group and team at Northeastern University. I wanted to specifically acknowledge uh, um, Emre Chandemirors, who has uh, um, you know, really the, been the driving force uh, uh, behind this work. Uh, PhD student Danny Tsunal and Karen Menos, who've been doing uh, uh, a lot of the work uh, um, in, you know, in the experimental work that we'll be discussing, and uh, uh, Stefano Basagni, uh, great colleague, who's helped a lot in this, and Daniel Uvaidov, also a PhD student that is working on um, some of the uh, AI-related topics that I'll be talking about at the end. Now, just to introduce a little bit of uh, context, uh, uh, the Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things at Northeastern uh, is a new interdisciplinary institute that includes uh, uh, faculty, uh, professional researchers, uh, and PhD students with uh, disciplinary expertise in a number of different areas that include sensor and energy harvesting, uh, wireless networking, there is significant uh, uh, expertise uh, in the area of uh, data analytics and machine learning, security and blockchains, and uh, we work together to apply this disciplinary expertise to a number of verticals that include things like the network or fighter, uh, the area of smart oceans that we'll be discussing today, connected vehicles and drones, what we like to call the Internet of Medical Things, and uh, uh, the space internet, among other things. Um, we are active in a number of uh, uh, research programs uh, in the United States in a number of different areas. Um, we, we certainly have significant expertise in next generation wireless. There is a lot of work ongoing in 5G, 6G wireless systems. Uh, the nexus between softwareization and spectrum sharing, uh, and also more uh, uh, exotic but exciting research areas like underwater networking. There's a significant amount of work ongoing in artificial intelligence, uh, applications of artificial intelligence to wireless system for inference and control, um, networking in contested environments and applications to verticals. We are funded uh, for the most part by the federal government of the United States. Uh, uh, Collectively, there's a number of sponsoring agencies, some from uh, maybe half of the funding comes from the National Science Foundation that I would like to acknowledge for support of uh, today's work, um, uh, as well as from a number of different uh, uh, other agencies related to defense and, 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 and other uh, um, areas. We have also a, a, a growing consortium of uh, uh, industry players that is supporting our work. And that not only provides us sponsorship, but it also provides us with uh, <clears throat> opportunities for transition and also for, for keeping our research uh, uh, honest and anchored to real problems. Now, today we're gonna be talking about uh, underwater acoustic networking. Uh, clearly, um, this is the focus of this seminar series. So I assume that folks are somewhat familiar and uh, uh, have been exposed to this area, but <clears throat> It's clearly an enabling technology for many applications related to the networked blue economy. And there's a, a number of applications in the defense space for underwater surveillance, uh, connecting um, unmanned underwater vehicles. Clearly the area of underwater robotics uh, uh, has had a significant growth in, in the last few years. There's exciting opportunities for uh, providing connectivity. There's a number of applications in uh, the general area of uh, offshore equipment monitoring, right? Clearly the oil and gas industry, but also uh, increasingly things like uh, uh, offshore wind farm. Uh, this this uh, infrastructure requires maintenance, requires surveillance, um, and uh, um, th there's growing opportunities for um, providing uh, advanced connectivity uh, and networking functionalities. And then there's uh, growing sectors of the economy like aquaculture uh, and environmental um, monitoring. In, in, in the world of aquaculture, they, for example, the United States has a significant seafood deficit. We don't produce enough seafood. Uh, and, uh, um, and there's a lot of opportunities to, for creating sustainable uh, aquaculture um, ranches uh, that will need to be uh, monitored and controlled um, with underwater communication systems. Okay. Now, the bottom line is that there's a number of heterogeneous and diverse applications the needs of uh, um, these applications are evolving and they're, incoming, they're becoming increasingly complex and diverse. And one size fits all solutions um, really don't cut it in, for, for these applications. There's also a number of applications 
what we like to call joint all domain command and control. So creating opportunities to connect different domains. And, and, and really what we want to connect here is the, um, the, the water domain, the underwater domain uh, with the air domain. And as we will uh, discuss uh, in, in the following of this talk, um, current technology makes it very hard to create networks that span uh, different domains. Now, talking about uh, um, uh, underwater communications, clearly underwater acoustics has been the technology of choice um, for underwater um, communications for a number of years. Uh, and uh, um, the, the problem is that the underwater acoustic channel is extremely uh, complex. It's characterized by uh, high path loss in general, uh, by significant uh, effect of multipath and Doppler spread. It is also highly uh, dependent on the specific uh, deployment environment, right? Uh, people say that uh, you, know, you, you, you can't find two different acoustic channels that look the same. And in fact, it, it's significantly dependent on the topology of the specific deployment, also in, on where you're deploying. Deploying is that uh, the ocean, lakes, rivers, uh, the, the, the acoustic channel is temporally and spatially varying. And in general, there is a limited amount uh, of bandwidth available, right? So the, the assumption of most of our work in the past few years has been that, um, yes, you need, uh, um, you need probably better uh, communication and modulation schemes uh, from the world domain, but you also need uh, the ability to uh, experiment uh, um, and, uh, uh, and to deploy new reconfigurable and programmable network architectures, right? That can enable uh, adaptation to the specific environments where you're operating, right? And when we talk about adaptation, we mean adaptation of the entire uh, networking uh, protocol stack, uh, all the functionalities from physical layer up to um, higher layer applications, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, the capability to provide different uh, uh, edge computing and processing functionalities. All right, what are some of the limitations of uh, existing commercial technologies? And this is by and large true also for uh, uh, your classical commercial wireless systems, right? Um, the, the, what, what we can purchase by and large is based on modems and pieces of hardware that are based on monolithic architectures where the networking functionalities at all layers of the protocol stack are intertwined with the, um, with the hardware architecture and uh, uh, basically inseparable from the hardware architecture. This makes it very hard to uh, update, improve, and reconfigure the communication functionalities of various layers of the protocol stack. It also leads to uh, vendor lock-in, right? There's proprietary architectures and protocols by and large, and very limited interoperability between um, uh, communication equipment that is developed by different uh, um, vendors uh, and providers. Also, lack of uh, um, plug and play solutions that can uh, self configure themselves. There's uh, significant size, cost, and energy efficiency limitations, and uh, low data rates. Uh, this varies. Uh, typical commercial products can provide data rates uh, uh, below 10 kilobits per second and have been designed with applications, with, with applications for. Um, long-range connectivity in mind. From, in, from, from the um, architectural perspective, uh, another limitation in today's technology is that, uh, by and large, existing commercial products lack networking abstractions. Networking abstractions is something that has been um, extremely important in, in the internet and in, the, in general in wireless systems in um, uh, enabling fast uh, prototyping of, of applications on top of networking applications, right? Uh, what you can get today by and large is uh, um, uh, devices that provide point-to-point uh, -point abstractions. So you can, you can create point-to-point -point links, um, but you don't have uh, uh, the capabilities to, uh, to implement and develop cross-layer algorithms uh, and to develop complex uh, uh, networked applications. Also, you have uh, very limited uh, uh, spectrum agility. You cannot implement uh, um, arbitrary waveforms uh, or, or modulation schemes. Uh, there is no support for dynamic spectrum allocation. You're, you're fixed uh, um, with, with the hardware that is provided uh, on your modems to a specific and usually narrow 
um, acoustic spectral band. And if you want to operate on different channels, you need to buy different hardware. Um, so you also lack the ability to uh, create dynamic algorithms that will enable reaction uh, on a frequency of waveform diversity to interference, to jamming, to collocated transmission, all things that we're starting to be able to do in the terrestrial domain, um, we, we cannot do um, uh, underwater today with existing um, ar architectures. And there's also, um, uh, by and large, what exists is incomparable with standard internet. Uh, there is um, no um, adaptation layers that uh, uh, can uh, um, enable uh, connectivity with standard internet and interoperability with uh, uh, internet-based networks. Now, we've been working for the past uh, few years on a project funded by the National Science, Science Foundation, um, we called CNET. Okay, CNET uh, um, is uh, trying to develop software-defined network systems and uh, AI algorithms for underwater communication services built uh, on a modular architecture. The idea of CNET is to um, uh, advance the capabilities on underwater networking by providing high-speed data rates um, to connect underwater assets, uh, full-stack internet-compatible networking, uh, the capability to interact with a modern uh, software-defined architecture and programmable architecture, uh, the capability to uh, provide both, both mesh network uh, and uh, Wi-Fi-like network. So imagine providing a, a, a base station that can provide illuminate a certain area and provide connectivity to a certain area, but also creating mesh connectivity. Uh, the ability to execute uh, uh, algorithms at the edge with AI-based control, and in general, an architecture is flexible, scalable, secure, robust, and resilient. So both goals um, we've made, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that we've accomplished uh, all these goals, but we've made uh, pretty good progress in this direction uh, in several different ways that I'm going to uh, describe now. Now, uh, just so, um, in, in, in general, this, this in the CINET project, as I said, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and, and funded also by um, Northeastern University, we're, we're hoping to be able to deploy a, a testbed um, based on the um, outcomes of the CINET project, uh, um, as what you see in, in this picture here, will provide uh, RF-based connectivity from a set of smart buoys that uh, will um, then uh, provide uh, a grid-like connectivity for a certain area. Now, CNET is based in general on um, uh, open architecture principles. Uh, it's a programmable software architecture where you can add and update functionalities at multiple layers of the portal stack. Uh, you can operate uh, at each layer. You can also hide the details uh, of each layer of the protocol stack. So if you don't want to mess with the physical layer, for example, you're provided abstractions uh, at the higher level through which you can use uh, um, existing uh, um, um, primitive building blocks. But if instead you want to modify uh, specific building blocks at lower layers of the load stack, you can do that through software. You have uh, um, a number of uh, 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 abstractions through which you can implement cross-layer interactions and reactive cross-layer interactions, so observing specific uh, uh, parameters of the total stack and uh, modify the behavior of several parameters of the total stack to be able to, um, uh, to adapt to the specific environment and application needs. Uh, you can reprogram physical layer characteristics uh, in an online and an offline fashion, uh, and it supports natively uh, an internet architecture by means of a Linux-based operating system. So the entire architecture is based on, uh, on Linux, and you can run standard uh, uh, internet protocols on top of that. From a hardware point of view, um, the the hydronet the, 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 the CNET modem is based on um, the, the idea of using swappable front ends. So it has a modular architecture where with, with different building blocks that can be uh, swapped uh, to uh, provide integration with different uh, uh, transducers um, and, on, and to operate on different frequency bands. Uh, it's operational on a number of different spectrum bands and also as a unit to wirelessly recharge uh, the modems. We're, we're uh, uh, looking at uh, um, wide spectral bands, uh, uh, including in the ultrasonic regime. So we're, we're trying to uh, look at, uh, at operations from uh, um, low frequency ranges up to two megahertz. 
uh, and where we've um, been uh, primarily focusing so far on short, uh, medium range links, but uh, the modem can also be integrated with transducers for long range links. So with uh, medium range links, we're looking at uh, um, uh, um, distances in the order of uh, hundreds of meters. That's, that's been primarily the sweet spot that we've been uh, focusing on, but we can also uh, operate at uh, uh, longer distances clearly with a trade-off on the data rates that can be achieved. Um, the idea is to look at being able to flexibly trade the link distance for data rate. So you have uh, um, programmable waveforms over these larger spectrum bands and clearly uh, lower frequency waveforms can reach um, farther away distance while higher frequency waveforms can provide higher data rates uh, but, but, but can propagate us um, farther away. And then you have the capability to process in real time uh, large uh, portions of bandwidth both for um, communication-based processing, so to communicate data, um, but also to provide the ability to uh, observe, uh, provide the, what, what is called in the terrestrial domain spectrum sensing, uh, and execute um, uh, inference algorithms on, uh, on, uh, on these wider spectral bands. Uh, and and the, the, the other characteristic is the ability to provide the high data rates, which we uh, understand in the order of uh, uh, certainly hundreds of kilobits per second. This has already been uh, demonstrated uh, uh, on, on links in the order of uh, hundreds of meters. Um, this is a little bit of an illustration of the uh, CNET modem, uh, the way it looks. It's, it's enclosed in a um, pressure casing and it's based on a number of boards that have been developed uh, within our team. Uh, this is a commercial battery, uh, what you see on the left. Uh, and, and this is the whole programmable architecture and its integration with, um, with, with uh, various transducers. Uh, it's, uh, it's a flexible communication platform. Um, it's because of the uh, architecture, it can also uh, provide the, the substrate for uh, multiple input, multiple output communication. It's not something that we've done other than some preliminary work, um, but, but uh, uh, you can swap, uh, you can connect multiple front ends to the same uh, um, board uh, and connect uh, uh, multiple transducers to that. So it has, from, from a hardware perspective, it has the uh, capability to, um, to, to, to process uh, um, uh, MIMO streams. Um, and another part of the project, and this is something that, you know, I haven't been uh, um, uh, doing it myself, it's been led by my colleague Matteo Rinaldi at Northeastern, has been uh, um, related with the idea of uh, developing piezoelectric micromachine transducers or PMATs. Um, th these are basically MEMS based uh, uh, transducers that uh, um, uh, are, are developed with a technology that is different with respect to your classical uh, bulk piezoelectric transducers. Um, the, the in, within the project, uh, uh, the, 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 the team has uh, demonstrated the capability to develop PMATs that can transmit uh, at ultrasonic frequencies. Uh, they've been used to transmit uh, uh, over at data rates. Uh, they've demonstrated in the, in the order of hundreds of kilobits per second, so 500 kilobits per second. Uh, the, the limitation as of now is that the, um, the propagation distance is not the same. Uh, the amount of power that can be um, uh, transmitted from the PMAT transducer is not the same as your bulk piece electric transducer. Um, at the same time, you can, you can create uh, uh, MIMO and beamforming capabilities with arrays uh, of PMATs in a very uh, small surface. So this is uh, um, uh, ongoing investigation and the hope is that you will be able to provide uh, uh, capabilities uh, to transmit at high data rates with lower uh, power consumption over short distances. Now getting um, a little more to in, in detail into the uh, hardware architecture of CNET. Um, this, what you see on the right here is a high level description of the, um, of the architecture, right? And it's, um, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's based on a modular design where you have a number of different modules that are connected with one another and can provide different functionalities. Um, by and large, we have, um, the, the architecture is based on uh, a main module that has uh, been uh, built um, on, on a board um, uh, that is uh, um, based on a Xilinx um, Zinc system on chip. 
Okay, so the <clears throat> one of the characteristics of uh, Xilinx system on chips is that uh, they contain on the same chip uh, a processing system based on dual ARM Cortex uh, uh, A9 processors. So, you know, uh, CPU, your regular CPUs. Uh, and on the same chip, you have uh, uh, programmable logic on FPGAs with uh, um, uh, uh, high speed uh, um, connections between the, um, the processor and FPGA. So you can create uh, software processing architectures where uh, some of the uh, functionalities that require low latency execution can be executed directly in the programmable logic, while some of the higher le level functionalities that don't require um, execution in the order of, uh, uh, say, uh, microseconds can be executed uh, um, in, in a processing system. And so whatever is uh, um, latency constraint and require deterministic execution, you can uh, execute on FPGA. Um, whatever needs flexibility and higher level control, you can execu execute in the uh, higher level processing system. The main module is then um, interfaced with a communication module. The communication module is basically your analog electronic component, uh, power amplifier and matching circuitry uh, to connect to a transducer. Uh, and uh, the uh, power amplifier on the transmit chain and uh, low noise amplifiers on the, um, on the receive chain. Um, the, the communication modules are swappable. So you, we, we can uh, generate different communication modules to interface with different transducers. As of today, we have a, a couple of different communication modules that have been uh, developed to um, interact with transducers at the, uh, medium frequency ranges. So imagine something in the ultrasonic regime between 50 and 150 kilohertz. Uh, and we have communication modules designed to uh, operate at lower frequency ranges between zero and, and 50 kilohertz. Uh, the converter module um, is uh, designed to uh, basically provide an interface between the digital domain, where, which is executed on the main module and, uh, uh, and the analog domain uh, in the communication module. Uh, the, the, the signal module is basically something that provides an interface with, uh, with transducers. And then there is uh, a module that provides interfacing with a central battery using a central battery unit um, and voltage regulators to, to connect to the various, uh, um, to the various uh, um, modules. And then you also have a number of interfaces to connect to different sensors, um, um, et cetera. So here's the architecture. Clearly, the, uh, the, 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 the main swappable components are the uh, communication modules and the transducers. Um, but and the architecture is uh, provided to uh, is designed to provide uh, hardware evolution and the ability to reconfigure and adapt to different use cases. Just a little uh, more detail on the um, uh, on on the hardware module. The um, hardware module is, um, as I said, based on Xinc uh, uh, seven thousand SoC. Uh, different versions of the modem we have to use different evolution, but this is the the, the part that is. Uh, been in the original design. Um, and um, as I said, the, the main characteristic is the ability of having in the same chip, uh, an ARM um, Cortex processing system and Xilinx uh, based uh, um, programmable logic from FPG, based on FPGA. Um, <clears throat> what, what are we doing with this architecture? If you, well, what you see here on, on the diagram on the right is uh, an example of, a, um, uh, of an, uh, um, communication system based on this architecture. So you have uh, the application layer, uh, the network layer, and uh, non-time non -time critical functionalities uh, of the data link layer that are executed on the processing system. So with uh, a high level code, uh, can be Python, um, for example. And uh, um, some of the uh, lower layer functionalities, including the, some time critical Mac functionalities, for example, the uh, ability to send acts quickly uh, or the ability to time uh, specific transmissions, uh, as well as uh, the baseband processing uh, functionalities um, of an OFDM communication system that are all uh, executed on the FPGA, okay? So high level uh, is executed on the ARM processor, uh, which you know can leverage uh, all the um, uh, uh, all the high level functionalities and the tools provided by uh, a Linux uh, operating system, 
low level functionality physical layer um, executed uh, on FPGA. Now, what, um, what, what's um, also, I think, uh, um, helpful to understand is that um, the fact that you are uh, executing functionalities on FPGA doesn't mean that you can't reconfigure those functionalities in real time. Uh, so there's a number of things that you can do to reconfigure functionalities that are executed on FPGA in real time. Um, one, one way that we do that is we, we have uh, implemented on the FPGA a number of uh, registers through which we can, uh, um, by uh, modifying values in the registers, um, uh, specifically uh, rearrange some of the functionalities of the physical layer. For example, you can change the modulation by just uh, uh, changing information in some of the registers uh, from, from commands that you can execute on the processors, right? So you can control that through high level code. Another thing that you can do um, in, in this architecture is to just uh, partially reconfigure the behavior of the PGA uh, in real time um, by modifying specific blocks, okay? So if you want to change the uh, number of FFT or IFFT points, um, you, you can do that uh, um, in, in real time with this architecture. Uh, this is just the, uh, the Avnet micro Z board that this is based on. Um, some, you know, some, some information about the uh, capabilities of the board. Uh, this is showing uh, um, the converter module. This is a board that's been uh, designed at, uh, uh, in our team at Northeastern. Uh, and that includes, um, uh, you know, it's been designed basically around the specific uh, analog to digital converter and digital to analog converters um, to be able to process the, uh, the bandwidth that we have in mind and its interface with the micro Z uh, architecture. And this is uh, two examples of uh, um, communication modules that have been developed with uh, um, specific uh, power amplifiers uh, um, and low noise amplifiers on the, transmit chain and receive chain. These have been, the specific module here has been designed to operate between 50 and 200 uh, um, kilohertz and can be interfaced uh, with, with uh, a few different transducers that operate uh, uh, at these frequencies, including the Teledyne uh, uh, Reason uh, TC4013, I believe, uh, um, as well as some of some BTEC uh, um, transducers. Um, signal, uh, signal module, as I said, it's basically, uh, a module providing the um, interface with uh, um, uh, cables to connect transducers, um, et cetera. Now, moving to the uh, software architecture um, in, in a little more detail, um, as I said, it's, it, it's based on a, um, open modular uh, reconfigure architecture. Uh, we have a, a software that is run in three different uh, um, parts uh, of the system, right? So uh, from, from a software perspective, we have programmable logic, okay? So this is, this comp these parts are executed on the FPGA. Uh, there's a processing system. Uh, so th this, um, th th this, these two boxes on the left are what is executed on the processor. And what's executed on the processor has uh, um, two different uh, components in a sense part that is executed in the kernel space of the Linux operating system and a component that is executed in the um, user space. And in many ways you can, you can mix and match between the uh, two different components. Uh, and and the, um, the other thing is it supports a lot of uh, uh, Linux native tools um, that you can uh, use to develop your, your, your system. Just a little more detail about uh, um, the uh, software architecture. This is the, the component that has been uh, um, developed uh, uh, at the university. We have two different uh, uh, designs at this point. We have a programmable uh, logic design. So basically uh, an OFDM um, transmitter and receiver that is executing the programmable logic on the FPGA. Um, we have a, a different design in which uh, um, you're, you're basically using the uh, modem as a complete software radio. So you do all the processing exclusively in software uh, and you're, uh, you're, you're uh, uh, just using the uh, FPGA for operations like up conversion, down conversion, et cetera. Uh, 
the the the, the software architecture um it, it has um <clears throat> You know, it basically has you 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 see the modem as a device driver um, in your Linux system. So it, it's seen basically as an uh, as an Ethernet interface, uh, and you can uh, you know just like you connect uh, uh, pro your protocol stacks to the Ethernet interface, you can do the same with uh, with the CNET architecture. All right, just um, a little bit of. Uh, an idea of some experiments that have been done. What you you're seeing here is deployments in the um, in in the ocean um, and on the uh, lakes. Um, there's you know where clearly the, there's a lot of experimental campaigns already ongoing. But we've been able to demonstrate, for example, data rates in the order of uh, um, 260 kilobit per second uh, uh, over 200 meters in lakes um, in in oceans. We've uh, uh, been able to demonstrate uh, uh, with with various uh, different uh, uh, characteristics data rates in, in the order of uh, uh, several hundreds of kilobits per second. Again, this depends by and large by the specific uh, uh, modulation and signaling scheme that you're going to develop. It's a software defined architecture, so you can bring your own uh, uh, um, modulation scheme uh, and protocols, and you're going to obtain different uh, uh, performances. Uh, we've also demonstrated things like uh, the ability to uh, do real-time reconfiguration, right? So you, what you see here is experiments uh, uh, in which you are modifying uh, on a per packet basis the guard level, um, um, uh, you know, interval uh, in an uh, in an RPM system. So different environments have different levels of multipath. You may want to. Um, Modify the, the, the guard interval and do that uh, in a continuous real time algorithmic software defined way. Um, and then, you know, this is, this is just showing some experiments um, in, in the lab uh, over low distances, demonstrating the capabilities of the MEMS transducers that are specifically have been uh, developed for this program. This is just for, just for fun, um, an aerial view of. Uh, some experiments that we conducted last summer in uh, um, the Marine Science Center, just a little, uh, little north of Boston. Um, Northeastern has a campus uh, in Nahant, Massachusetts, um, that uh, you know uh, that, that provides access to oceans. And uh, with um, you know, uh, our team has been having quite some fun in, in, in trying to demonstrate. Uh, uh, some of these capabilities. This, you know, you, you'll see them on this on the little boat. Uh, that's uh, um, folks from our team, and it's and it's a beautiful area. It provides for a, um, a lot of. Fun. All right. So um, the the second thing that I wanted to uh, talk about today um, is some of the uh, recent work that we've been doing on extending some of the capabilities of our software defined modems to provide the connectivity between um, air, water, um, and uh, uh, cyber capabilities, right? So the um, general idea is it, it's uh, pretty hard to provide connectivity between uh, um, water and air, right? And the reason is that uh, uh, signals, your classical, both, both acoustic signals and radio frequency signals don't um, cross easily the interface between uh, the two. So we've been working on developing technology, software defined technology to provide bidirectional connectivity between water and air uh, based on uh, uh, um, visible blue light. Okay. Uh, and this is just, I'm going to show a little bit of a teaser video and aerial and under that we developed for, uh, um, for uh, our presentation at SECON earlier this year. But I think we'll play a vital role. It's fun to look at, sorry. Try again. Autonomous and unmanned aerial and underwater vehicles will play a vital role in applications where distributed assets across multiple domains operate in unison to accomplish a common goal. As of today, the only viable way is to deploy floating buoy systems that are capable of relaying data. So how can we eliminate the usage of these floating devices?
Propose a communication system enabling robust, secure, high data rate and self-optimizing by directional links across the air-water interface without requiring any relay nodes using software-defined visible light networking. If you want to hear more about this work, register for our talk at IEEE 2nd 2021 on July 6. Okay, you don't need to register for second because you... <laughs> We're here, but uh, okay. So the, the the general idea, as, as I mentioned, is that uh, acoustic communications, uh, acoustic signals, they tend to be reflected by the air water interface, right? And RF signals are also not an option because of their um, high attenuation underwater. So the default option to create uh, connectivity across the domains is to use an intermediate buoy, right? That can take the signal maybe acoustically from, um, from the water and then relay the data um, through RF to, um, to, to, to um, uh, drones, right? Um, but clearly this is not, you know, you, you can't really cover vast portions of the oceans with this architecture. And uh, uh, fun fact, uh, uh, sometimes some of these buoys get stolen, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, there's, <laughs> and there's ransoms. Um, so there's, there's approaches in the, limiter, in the literature uh, that use um, uh, optical communications uh, in several cases, uh, but they, you know, by and large require, they've been based on highly controlled test beds on communication with uh, um, uh, LEDs or they've been based on uh, um, simulation data, right? So we wanted to uh, try and develop a practical bidirectional communication systems um, that doesn't require an excessive amount of alignment uh, and that can provide this capability connected with the software defined architecture of our modem. Uh, other approaches uh, uh, that can um, um, include uh, uh, the uh, translational acoustic RF communication system that have been proposed by um, a team at MIT um, that, you know, however, the, um, it, it works in very uh, specific conditions and it provides very low data rates. Or magnetic induction, which is also an alternative. It's uh, by and large at an R&D stage, um, but it uh, also provides uh, a typically lower communication uh, rates than what you can do with optical. So we propose to use software defined visible light networking to enable robust uh, uh, and bidirectional communication links uh, through the air water interface. Uh, spectrally, it's spectrally efficient um, and it's uh, suitable for ocean dynamics. So it doesn't, uh, uh, the, the performance doesn't significantly vary based on uh, the turbulence uh, um, uh, of, the, of the water and uh, um, the wave conditions. The, um, we, we started by developing a simulator initially, and then we designed the prototype, the software defined visible light communication modem. Uh, it's based on a similar architecture um, as our acoustic modem. Uh, it has uh, uh, primarily three modules. Um, the main modules is also based on a micro Z um, board. So same architecture with um, FPGA and processor on a board. Um, in, in our main module, we included also DAC and ADC in this case, which uh, uh, clearly um, provide the um, interface to the VLC hardware. And then um, the, the main module provides all the software uh, reprogrammability, compact packaging, and low energy consumption. And there is a power and switch module uh, that interfaces the module to battery unit and that carries the analog and digital signals between the different modules through PCI Express connectors. And then the VLC front end includes an LED driver on the transmitter side. The driver is uh, composed of a single and channel MOSFET with a common source topology with source degeneration. And on the receiver side, the VLC front end uses, sorry, it's, it's moving. It has, it, it has autonomous life. Um, the, um, the, the, so I was saying that the VLC front end uh, has an LED driver on the transmitter side. Um, and there is a, a MOSFET with common source topology. And on the receiver side, there's a silicon avalanche photo detector with uh, um, uh, 400 megahertz uh, uh, bandwidth. Uh, and the, you know, after the current to voltage conversion with a trans impedance amplifier, the signal is then amplified by a, a variable gain amplifier. 
and uh, we can control the gain of the VGA of the variable gain amplifier from the main module, from, from software running on the main module. So we can, um, we, we can adapt that. Um, we've been using primarily two different uh, um, test beds uh, in our, for our water tank experiments. Um, we have a pre-aligned setup, which you see on the left there. The modems are basically there pre-aligned and separated uh, uh, one meter from, uh, from each other. One, one is submerged, one is in air. Um, and um, they, you know, they, they are aligned with a six feet um, aluminum rod. Uh, and the, so basically in this way you have, uh, you, you minimize the misalignment, right? The, the, two, the two modems are, are perfectly, or semi-perfectly aligned. Um, the, in, in, in the second uh, um, test bed, which you see on the right here, the X and Z axis are uh, variable. Um, and the, um, you can, um, uh, the, the modem in the air is attached to a crane that can move in the Z and uh, X directions. And the submerged modem is fastened to an anchor. Uh, and, and, uh, and you can change the, the distance between the modem. Um, so you can, you, can, you can modify the distance as well as the misalignment. Um, we've, we've done, and an, I'm not gonna go through um, uh, all the details, uh, um, but we've, we've been doing a, a lot of uh, um, experiments in the water tank, starting with uh, uh, analysis of different modulation schemes. Um, the, the, the most distinctive characteristics of the visible light communication is that the uh, transmitted waves are non-coherent, right? So we can use uh, um, intensity modulation and direct detection um, to, to provide communication schemes. Um, most common modulation schemes in uh, systems uh, for optical communications are on-off keying and uh, uh, with Manchester encoding. Um, if we want to increase the data rate, we can use some multi-carrier modulation schemes, uh, things like uh, um, CAP, which is a, which is a carrier-less uh, um, amplitude phase modulation, or there's special cases of FDM um, called DSO, ACO, and FLIP or FDM. I'm not gonna go uh, through the details. You can find the details in the paper. Um, uh, but in general, the, the idea is that uh, when you compare, uh, um, th th these are experiments that are done in the, the setups that I mentioned earlier, one megahertz of bandwidth uh, um, with, with the same spectral efficiency to maintain uh, fairness in the comparison. Uh, and the CAP modulation uh, um, seems to outperform uh, um, the other schemes in, in, in most of the experiments that, that we did. Uh, what's uh, remarkable is you can certainly uh, uh, obtain uh, high data rate communications uh, um, with, with um, um, pretty good reliability uh, in that. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but we have um, analysis of the distance of misalignment, uh, of the effect of uh, um, water surface waves on the performance uh, um, uh, and on the uh, water clarity, what happens with different uh, uh, levels of water clarity, what happens with different uh, uh, levels of background noise. Uh, and, and last, uh, uh, we also demonstrated the uh, proposed software defined system to create bidirectional links um, in, in, uh, in the ocean. Um, uh, and uh, again, we tested uh, uh, CAP and DS, DCO OFDM modulation schemes at one megabit per second uh, with one megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, the results are similar to what we observe in the water tank experiments. Um, with, for example, with CAP modulation, um, you can get uh, uh, at 10 and 13 dB, um, you can get uh, um, 10 to the minus five bit error rate levels uh, over distances of one meter. Okay, um, getting to the end of my talk, I just wanted to um, talk about a couple of things that we're, we're, we're doing now and that I think are enabled uh, um, quite uniquely by the availability of uh, uh, flexible platforms like the, uh, the model we've been, we've been discussing. Right? There's a lot of interest in uh, um, inference and in uh, observing things that are happening um, uh, underwater by analyzing um, uh, data in real time that comes from uh, uh, acoustic and ultrasonic transducers, right? 
uh, and clearly um, in the world of uh, radio frequency wireless uh, uh, applications of artificial intelligence to wireless uh, have proven to be, I mean, th th there's a lot of interest and attention in the last few years, uh, both for applications related to inference, specifically from the wireless channel, and for applications related to control. Okay, what are some of the things that you can do with artificial intelligence? Well, you can uh, observe directly the IQ samples um, that come from uh, a, an analog to digital converter, right? And um, infer uh, things that are happening on the uh, acoustic channel, right? So an example um, of this is what, what you see um, highlighted in, in this slide, which is certainly preliminary work, but, but quite interesting nonetheless, which we have, uh, deployed uh, um, a uh, modem as a receiver, right? And uh, um, different modems uh, in different positions are as transmitters. Um, and we have collected data at the receiver and we've used the data, this, by data I mean here, um, basically baseband uh, uh, IQ samples, right? Uh, as a transmitter and receiver through, and received through the acoustic channel. Um, the, the, the samples, the baseband samples have been used to train uh, convolutional neural networks. And specifically we've been uh, looking at uh, um, VGG16 architectures, have been trained with the, with the data um, collected in these experiments. And we've been doing a few different things, like for example, uh, recognizing different waveforms, right? So observing a few samples, 256 IQ samples, so very, very short time sequences of IQ samples and uh, being able to infer what is being transmitted on the wireless channel, right? Is, there, is the channel empty? Is there a um, chirp spread spectrum modulated signal? Is there a direct sequence spread spectrum modulated signal? Is there an FSK signal? Is there a no FDM signal? And, uh, um, and you know, based on our preliminary work, um, it's, we, we, we can recognize uh, uh, different signals with uh, significant accuracy. We can, we can do more than that. We can, we can recognize different modulation schemes, but we can also recognize specific devices, right? So we can fingerprint based on their uh, acoustic signature, uh, specific devices uh, and use this, for example, to <clears throat> prevent spoofing attacks. Now going forward, we're going to, do, um, to, to use uh, um, these techniques to do a couple of different things. One is uh, um, work on mitigating attacks. And so using uh, baseband IQ samples that are run through deep convolutional neural networks to um, identify the presence of adversarial actions and be able to uh, reconfigure in real time uh, reactively the communication scheme at the physical and minimum access control layer to um, uh, mitigate the effect of uh, the adversarial jump, right? For example, um, it's uh, the, 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 the jammer is trying to jam my uh, OFDM pilot signals or something else, um, uh, I can react uh, and modify the waveforms of the physical minimum access control layer optimally to react to that. This is something that you know, we've, we've been doing um, quite a bit of this work uh, in the radio frequency wireless domain and with the availability of software defined modems for underwater communications, we're going to be able to um, do the same thing in the underwater domain. Another idea is the, the, the notion of polymorphic communications, right? In the polymorphic communications, the idea is that you're not uh, using uh, fixed parameters that are pre-negotiated between the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, you're, you're instead continuously hopping between um, different parameters. Uh, for example, you're continuously varying uh, the number of FFT points uh, in, a, um, in an FDM waveform, uh, and you're also uh, varying the modulation scheme used um, on each different carrier without necessarily telling the receiver, but a receiver has been trained to be able to, um, to, to communicate with a, poly with a polymorphic transmitter uh, can uh, uh, just by observing um, a, a few uh, IQ samples, uh, adapt the behavior of the, uh, adapt the, the um, the software processing pipeline of the receiver in real time to receive uh, uh, on a packet by packet basis uh, the to, to adapt to the parameters on the um, on the transmitter side uh, and and be able to demodulate that in real time. This is something that can we've we've uh, uh, demonstrated in the uh, RF wireless domain uh, and that can be um, transposed to underwater domain thanks to the availability of uh, software acoustic modems. 
Um, and same thing for control. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but uh, you, you can uh, um, implement through uh, software, pretty sophisticated uh, uh, strategies for control of the parameters that, is, that are adaptive to the characteristics of the environment uh, um, and, and do that in, uh, um, in real time and in a pretty efficient way by uh, doing that on, a, on, on FPGA. Um, we're, um, we're quite excited with this work. We've uh, uh, launched uh, um, uh, recently a, a spin-off called Hydronet that will be uh, trying to um, commercialize this technology. Uh, and uh, that uh, will be uh, developing technology for uh, providing underwater base stations, as well as uh, um, uh, underwater mesh networks based on open programmable and softwareized uh, uh, architectures um, based on this model. And um, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, you know, we're getting to the top of the hour and we probably want to leave time for a couple of questions. Um, which I'll be very glad to take. Okay. Thank you very much, Tomas. A very impressive uh, work, solid and uh, innovative at the same time. Thank you for sharing. You. Uh, so yeah, there are a couple of questions uh, already in the q and I don't know if you can read it yourself or you want me to read it. I can read it uh, maybe also for the other people that uh, uh, may not see it. So. Yeah, okay, uh, so the one question that I'm seeing uh, from, yeah. from Igor is asking if we th thought of including uh, um, non-acoustic communication modes, and I think I probably answered that in the second part of the talk. Um, so yes, we, we've uh, been looking uh, primarily at uh, um, visible light, uh, blue visible light communications for uh, bridging the uh, interface between uh, uh, water and air. Uh, the blue visible light can also be used uh, uh, over relatively short links uh, um, in the uh, just directly in water, right? So you, you can um, you can and and in the CNET architecture, the way it's been designed, it, it hasn't been uh, um, tested at this point. But um, we we can uh, um, uh, operate in parallel the visible light and the acoustic uh, front ends, right? So it's it's uh, th there's a common baseband processing. And you can put two different transducers and switch between one of, and, and the other, or potentially even uh, um, operate them in parallel. But um, th there may be some complications in terms of operating them in parallel, in the sense that um, you need to be able to process the two streams uh, uh, in parallel on the FPGA or on the processors. And that, that may, um, de depending on the amount of bandwidth that you're trying to process, that may or may not be possible. Um, mm -hmm. And the uh, magnetic induction is an option. I, obviously, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, um, technology itself, but we haven't really uh, worked on that at, at, uh, up to this point. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, there is another question uh, following from Osama. Can you see yeah. that too? Yeah, you can see the interaction between multiple nodes. We, we, we've been doing a lot of work that is mostly simulation based with some experiments on uh, looking at interactions between multiple nodes. Uh, the, the, the focus of the experimental work has been mostly um, looking at uh, uh, establishing, you know, and, and uh, making the, uh, the actual uh, model more robust, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, I have uh, another question offline from Julia who couldn't uh, write in the question and answer. She wanted to know which are the typical distances between the underwater vehicle and the drone in the, in the yeah. DLC work. That's a very good question. So um, I would say with, with the current architecture, with the current uh, power amplifiers that are used and current uh, um, uh, um, uh, low noise amplifiers on the receive chain, it's probably in the order of um, 10 meters, okay, what you can achieve today. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that's not, that, that's more of a limit of the hardware that we are using now than uh, um, of, the, um, of the physics, right, per se. Uh, so you can, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Kerem, one of the students has been working on uh, uh, a higher range version. Uh, what, what is looking into, you know, obviously as in, always in life, there's 
there's there's trade-offs. So he's looking at uh, sort of reducing the um, sort of the the you know, it's clear it's diffusive light, right? So he's looking at reducing the the, the cone, the aperture cone, uh, and and uh, um, getting a, a higher transmission range with that mm -hmm. using L, L and he's looking into um, using lasers as well. Lasers obviously need the, more directional uh, uh, pointing, but uh, uh, they have uh, um, less, uh, uh, you know, they're more directional. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question. I think that you mentioned the dynamic of the water. So Julia wanted also to know about the effect of waves, if you uh, took that into consideration. Yeah, um, the, I think the, um, now what, well, what we did here, and uh, you know, it's uh, um, it, we, we've been doing some some work in the water tank primarily, right, to evaluate this. Uh, um, so we have uh, three. We, we've we've generated three centimeter peak to peak surface waves, uh, um, and uh, they were uh, you know the surface display. We we measure the surface displacement with uh, some um, Arduino boards, um, and. Uh, you know, we, we, you basically have uh, uh, the, with, with a flat water surface, you have a fluctuation of 0 0.5 dB uh, in the um, in the received signal in the SNR, right? Uh, mm -hmm. With with the waves, sorry, this is moving. I don't know why it's moving on its own. <laughs> with with the waves, uh, um, you have uh, basically 3.5 dB fluctuation. Okay. Um, it, the, the link keeps going. You have an effect on the bit error rate. It's the, um, depending on what your SNR, you can have a, um, a reduction in the bit error rate. Um, but but uh, for example, in these experiments, right, the signal to noise ratio was relatively high, 20 uh, in the order of 25 dB. So reducing by 3.5 dB um, the SNR didn't affect the communication link at all. It was still 10 to the minus six bit error rate. So um, obviously with surface waves uh, that are much more significant than that, um, it will need to be tested, um, but seems to be pretty reasonable. 